This is the Tom McBee Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. The Tom McBee Tales is a podcast about a small town in northeast Mississippi along the Tom Bigby River called Columbus. Sometimes it's about the surrounding communities and surrounding counties. Today's topic is titled The Sociopath Among Us. Jean Tate was a beautiful mom of four, wife, and Columbus socialite who lived in Tawny Cherokee Hills neighborhood in Columbus, Mississippi. Tate was a stunningly beautiful woman with a huge smile. The once homecoming queen served in many philanthropic groups, the PTA and social and social clubs. Her husband was a well-respected, prosperous local businessman, Erwin Tate, who owned Besco Business. Her life was perfect, happy and possibly idyllic in a leave it to beaver kind of way. That is, until her eight-year-old son found Jean, his beautiful mother, garroted in a pool of blood on the floor of the family's garage. The first suspect, handsome, muscled, and dynamic 20-year-old college student next door, John Maddox. Maddox was home from Mississippi State on probation for either behavior issues, grades, or both, depending on the news article you read. He had been a physics major at the university. Maddox was initially questioned and dismissed as a suspect of the murder. That is, until his friend slash girlfriend, Sarah Grayson, called police to tell them Maddox told her before the killing that he had had an affair with Jean Tate, and she had ended it. Maddox was furious and obsessed with how he could kill her and leave no fingerprints. He would choose a wire hanger, as he felt no fingerprints could be retrieved from a hanger. It would be the perfect crime. Eventually, Maddox would try and hire someone to kill Grayson, now a transfer student, to UC Berkeley, but the men he hired confessed, though that portion of the case would be ignored in order to concentrate on the Tate murder. Maddox's attorneys would spend the bulk of the trial trying to put forward a false narrative that Tate and Maddox were romantically involved in order to diminish the level of guilt to manslaughter for Maddox. The defense team would attack Sarah Grayson's credibility as a witness, accusing her of only being interested in the $5,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of Maddox and that she would use that money to buy a sports car. And she thrived on, quote, being the star in her own melodrama for the the defense team. Maddox was quite the heartthrob during the trial. Throngs of girls from the local women's college would fill the gallery and circle around him at every court recess. It became such a problem that the school's provost gave out an edict that any student caught at or near the courthouse would be suspended from college and sent home to her parents. John Maddox attended every day of trial in his typical college attire creased khakis, starched cotton plaid shirt, and penny loafers. He exuded confidence. The details exposed at trial included both the mundane and the horrific. The Maddox home and the Tate's garage were about six feet apart. Mrs. Tate was murdered between 1030 and 1055 Sunday morning, January 31st, 1960. Mr. Tate had returned home with three of their children, the fourth was off visiting grandparents, from Sunday school around 10.55 that morning. Jean Kane Tate's body was found dead in a pool of blood with a coat hanger and a black scarf twisted around her neck. I'm going to read from the court documents themselves because I think they better explain much of the story. Mr. Tate testified that relations between himself and his wife had been strained for several months up until about the early fall of 1959 because of the 
of Maddox's manifest interest in Mrs. Kane and that Maddox was constantly staring at her, following her in his car at night when she would leave and return to his home in his car shortly after she would return. And that on one occasion, Maddox followed them, Mr. and Mrs. Tate, in his car when he and his wife went to a drive-in movie. However, a few weeks before the homicide, everything appeared to be all right between them, but his wife was afraid to stay at home with only the children. A shirt belonging to Maddox was introduced into, into evidence. The jury was justified in finding that it was worn by him on the morning of the homicide. A laboratory expert Bert, from the FBI testified that he found on the blouse that Mrs. Tate was wearing at the time of her murder seven blue cotton fibers. And on her pedal pushers, which are kind of like uh, longer shorts, he found a single blue cotton fiber. Examining these fibers microscopically, he was of the opinion that the fibers on her clothing either originated from this shirt or from a source with similar blue cotton fibers, that they matched in every microscopic character the fibers found in Maddox's shirt. The number of fibers on Jean Tate's clothing indicated contact between the two garments. A blue bathrobe belonging to one of the Tate boys was offered in evidence. The laboratory expert stated that the fibers on Mrs. Tate's clothing were dissimilar in color to those of the robe, but the dissimilarity was not a sufficiently great number to entirely eliminate the latter as a po possible source. However, he said there were no dissimilarities between the fibers on Mrs. Tate's garments and those from Maddox's shirt. A service station operator saw Maddox between 10 and 11 on that Sunday, and he said that Maddox was wearing a pretty blue checkered shirt, which was either the identical shirt in evidence or one of the same color and type. Several days after the homicide, the Columbus chief of police requested Maddox's father to turn over to him the clothing which the which Maddox was wearing on the Sunday morning Mrs. Tate was killed. His father delivered the, to the chief a package containing the shirt in evidence. Maddox denied that he had worn that shirt that morning. The testimony of the service station operator, the chief of police, and the FBI laboratory expert, and, the and Maddox's denials presented issues for the jury as to whether Maddox wore this shirt on the morning of the homicide and whether the fibers on Mrs. Tate's clothing came from this shirt belonging to Maddox. Detective Lewis Harper talked with, with, <clears throat> with Maddox after his indictment. He asked Maddox why the finger of suspicion had been pointed at him, to which Maddox replied, well, I'm not the only one that could have committed this crime. Harper observed that, if that were true, he would like Maddox to tell him the others, whereupon, quote, John jumped up and says, well, I'll tell you why, because I was there, end quote. And when he said that, he immediately stopped and said, were you in the garage, John? And he said, I was there. And then he shut up. Harper stated that Maddox denied killing Mrs. Tate. However, his testimony placed him in the immediate vicinity of the crime. Miss Sarah Grayson then testified that she became a friend of Maddox as a fellow student at Mississippi State University. She related at length their various conversations and told of a picnic on November 4th, 1959, when she said that Maddox told her of a love affair that he was having with a married woman in Columbus, who was his neighbor and the mother of four children that Maddox said she stopped the affair because of her love for her family, that Maddox was commented on how easy it would be to kill someone with a scarf similar to that of the witnesses. Several days before the homicide, she said Maddox told her that he had figured out how to commit the perfect crime by using a coat hanger, which would not leave fingerprints. After the homicide, Maddox was visibly upset in Miss Grayson's presence. She advised the authorities, both because of her fears of Maddox and because she thought it was her duty. She was vigorously cross-examined. 
Her testimony was clear, consistent, and reasonable, and the jury had the right to accept it, as it apparently did. After Ms. Grayson's cross-examination by the defense counsel, the defense counsel made a motion that the state be required to produce a written statement which she had given the district attorney in his investigation of the case. According to this to this uh, court case, it states, we do not think the trial court abuses discretion in overruling that motion. The applic applicable principles are fully discussed in Ballou versus State. The motion was without merit. Moreover, there was no showing that the written statement was inconsistent with the witness testimony in the trial. Uh, <clears throat> Maddox was placed in the Lauderdale County Jail pending his appeal to the court after his first conviction. Also incarcerated there for several weeks were two brothers, Dan and Fred Wilkerson, who had been convicted of armed robbery. They both testified that although Maddox never said he killed Mrs. Tate, he did say that he loved her, and if he could not have her, no one else could, that Maddox asked them to kill Miss Sarah Grayson, who was a witness against him. Fred Wilkerson said that Maddox also stated that he had asked Mrs. Tate to run away with him, but she refused because she loved her children and husband more than she did him, and that Maddox offered to pay the Wilkerson's $1,500 to kill Miss Grayson when she came home to, to Mississippi at Christmas from a university on the West Coast, and that it was arranged that Maddox would mail them a picture of Grayson for identification, and that he received that Wilkerson received through the mail, enclosed in a Christmas card addressed to him at his mother's residence, a picture of Miss Grayson. The state then introduced into evidence a piece of paper with the written address of Sarah Grayson in Berkeley, California, which Fred, Fred said Maddox handed to him before Fred left the Lauderdale County Jail, and also introduced in evidence an envelope addressed to Fred Wilkerson at his mother's residence containing a Christmas card and also a picture of Miss Grayson. A deputy sheriff testified that he was present when Wilkerson's mother brought him the sealed envelope containing the card and picture. Maddox admitted that the piece of paper with Miss Grayson's address and the address on the Christmas envelope were in his own handwriting, but he said the Wilkerson's must have stolen these items when they left the Lauderdale County Jail. Witnesses for Maddox testified that the Wilkerson's reputation for veracity was bad. Whether their testimony was true or not was was an issue for the jury. The state offered rather strong circumstantial corroborative support for their accounts. The question is whether this evidence by the Wilkerson's of attempts by the accused, Mr. Maddox, to procure the death of one of the material witnesses against him, Miss Sarah Grayson, was, admit was admissible in evidence. The great weight of authority holds that it is. Generally speaking, all evidence introduced in a criminal prosecution must be relevant to the guilt or innocence of the accused. But that rule is not violated by the admission of evidence that accused attempted to suppress evidence against himself. So the testimony of the Wilkerson's, along with the documentary evidence, was considered usable and admissible as part of the state's case. Um. The evidence was used to show an attempt by Maddox to procure the murder of a material witness against him pending appeal from his first conviction and prior to the second trial and was therefore admissible in evidence for evaluation by the jury. So Maddox did it was pretty much damning himself. Um, the, in... Um, in the end of this case, <laughs> um, the testimony of the Wilkerson's uh, of attempts by Maddox to procure the death of Miss Sarah Grayson, the material witness against him, was considered admissible in evidence as being in the nature of an implied admission. 
Maddox denied any love affair with Mrs. Tate and denied the conversations with Miss Grayson and the other principal portions of the state's evidence, contradicting his testimony in previous days at trial. He described several trips he made that Sunday morning, but by his own testimony, placed himself in the near vicinity of the homicide at the time it was committed. When he stated that he returned to his home at very near 1030 that morning, Detective Harper's testimony also reflected an admission by the defendant that he was at least close by the scene at the time when the crime must have been committed. The record is lengthy, lengthy, but the foregoing is an outline of the evidence upon which the conviction was based. Okay, so in summary, the state made a strong circumstantial evidence case and the issues um, were appropriately presented. And um, <laughs> uh, the and the uh, and Mrs. Tate was murdered, and it was done in accordance with the def with the defendant Maddox's own threats, the method and plan that he had already stated, and he was convicted and found guilty. So the case was not overturned. And Maddox was sentenced to parchment, where he was a model prisoner and eventually became a trustee in 1966. However, he was paroled in 1971 after only serving 10 years in prison, and whereupon he left prison and moved to Alabama. He moved to Huntsville, where his brother was living. He married and served as a deacon at a Huntsville, Alabama Church of Christ in the 1980s and 90s. He is now 84 years old and still living in Huntsville, where he raised his two children. Sarah Grayson earned her sociology degree at Berkeley, went on to found the famous Petrushka restaurant in Berkeley, and became eventually a Zen practitioner and a very respected Zen priestess. Jean Tate is buried in Friendship Cemetery next to her parents in Plot, uh, sorry, excuse me, in Plot 927 next to her mother. This case has been much discussed, has been written about in several books. It has been featured on television and in other podcasts. Jean Tate's grandchildren never got to meet her, unlike John Maddox, whose children and grandchildren still get to enjoy his presence. If Jean Tate was alive today, she was born in 1929 and would be well into her 90s. I want to thank you for coming to my podcast, The Tom Bigby Tales. If you'd like to learn more about this case, the Columbus Lowndes County Library has uh, a complete archive collection of newspaper clippings and the court findings will within their archival um, collection. I want to thank you again. My name is Shannon Evans, and this is the Tom Bigby Tales. Good night.